Do you want to make your own podcast? Spotify has a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And this is the platform that I use because it makes it so simple to record and distribute your podcast all in one place using your cell phone. What you need to do is download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com backslash podcasters to get started. Hello, my name is Katherine Moore, social worker, mom, coffee lover, and founder of Social Workers Rise, where we inspire social workers to connect, expand their knowledge, and change more lives than they ever thought possible. I'm so excited you found my podcast. We will talk everything social work on every level from micro to macro. We will hear the stories of social workers who are doing big things, learn new skills, and most importantly, give you actionable steps to make a difference today. Let's go. Before we hop into this episode, it's important to acknowledge that being a new grad and a new worker can be really hard sometimes. It's not in your head. It really can be hard. And grad school just doesn't teach us everything that we need to know to be successful in the real world with our jobs. So in order to bridge that gap, we created the Clinical Essentials for the Future Therapist. This course will fast track you into honing those skills that you need to actually help your clients in an individual setting. It'll save you time when you're trying to figure out what the heck to document. It's going to increase your confidence in your abilities that you are doing this right and give you the tools that you need to be even more effective. And it's going to improve the professional quality of your notes so that when your colleagues and your coworkers read them, they say, wow, that's a really thorough, detailed note. I love it. Let's do this. And it provides clarity on how to help the person. So if this sounds like something you would benefit from, definitely check the link in the show notes for the clinical essentials for the future therapist. With that, let's hop into this episode. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Social Workers Rise. I am so excited that you are here. We all know that traditionally social workers have been overworked, underpaid, and undervalued to the point that advocating for ourselves can be really, really challenging, really difficult, so many consequences that could come from speaking up, and it's scary. There can be repercussions in your job. You can get fired, all of these things. You can lose your income and We're already underpaid, so we don't exactly have a big amount of savings to be stack, you know, to be accessing and tapping into. So this week we're talking with Trisha and Joyce. They are two amazing social workers straight out of Chi Town in Chicago that have started this this conversation, a movement, if you will, around unionized social work. And they have a Facebook group that's pretty active and they act as a resource for you to get more information and just to learn more about how this process works. So I'm so excited that we will be hearing from them. If this is something that you are passionate about, definitely, definitely reach out to them, give them a follow, join the Facebook group. There is power in numbers. And with that, let's get started. Hello, welcome to Social Workers Rise. Trisha and Joyce, I am so excited to have you here with me on the podcast. Would you ladies like to introduce yourself? Uh, Sure. Hi, my name is Joyce. I'm a social worker here in Chicago. 
Um, and uh, I've been working kind of out in the community as a community-based social worker for the last three years. Uh, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Trisha. Um, I'm also a social worker. I work inpatient um, and I do discharge planning uh, full time. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much. So I'm so excited to talk to you because you ladies are spearheading the National Social Work Alliance. And I am like a full believer that we all need to come together and there is power in numbers. So I've heard you, you know, I'm in your Facebook groups, I've seen your Instagram and like, you know, stalking you a little bit. Um, and we've had these conversations before, but I've heard you talk a lot about unionizing and like the need for a social work union. So where does that come from? Like, what do you see as the need for a, for a social work union? Oh my gosh. So, um, you, you know, so as I'm looking at things on the internet and talking to other social workers, um, you know, during COVID, especially, I think that's really what sort of helped, like, you know, spark the flame here. Um, you know, hearing about social workers trying to, you know, just do their jobs and function every day, and then their employers are expecting them to perform their regular job duties without having proper PPE and uh, recognizing safety uh, guidelines from the CDC. And, you know, historically, we've always been in working in, in dangerous environments. And, you know, that that really sparked this this whole thing from my perspective at least how about you joyce yeah i would add that you know um since we started the group and uh had the opportunity to just kind of talk to other social workers on a national level and have conversations with folks in you know alaska and uh in the south and you know california wherever they might be and it just seems like so many of the issues that we encounter are universal. We talk about pay equity, we talk about safety, and we talk about working conditions. And when I think of those three topics, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, unionizing because you know members of unions tend to have on average higher pay, they tend to have safer working conditions and they tend to have um, you know, maybe more reasonable uh, workloads because they've got a union uh, that backs them. Um, I don't think all unions are the same necessarily, right? But it's it's an answer to a much needed universal issue that we have found pretty much across the board within our profession. That's so interesting because I don't come from a background that I'm very familiar with unions. But yeah, everything that you said makes sense because I know that safety is a concern, low wages is a concern. When I first came out with Social Workers Rise, I, I said, and I was, kind, I was actually kind of nervous, like full disclosure saying this, that social workers are an impoverished population because we have such high student loans and our pay is not, it's like 20,000 less than the average pay starting with a master's degree. So if you look at any other job profession, just starting out in the field, ours is significantly less just entering the field. So I get it, I get it. I'm, I'm so excited for you ladies. I did want have a clarifying question because I've seen the National Social Work Alliance and I've also seen unionized social work now what is the difference between these two? Can you kind of break it down for me? Yeah, so Unionized Social Work Now was really the beginning of um, us talking more broadly about what next steps need to happen. I think that um, you can consider Unionized Social Work Now to be more of a campaign, um, a slogan, if you will, a hashtag that will spark the conversations that need to happen and maybe also cause people to want to learn more about what exactly that might mean. Um, when we created, or it's really Trisha created Unionized Social Work Now, um, the hope was just to get the conversation started, right? Um, and it became so successful in such a short amount of time. I think that that 
that group that was formed on Facebook really started in August of 2020 and um, we're in January 2021 and we have almost 800 people and you know folks reaching out to us wanting to know more. Um, and so the NSWA National Social Workers Alliance really stemmed from that campaign. But the purpose of NSWA is to create a more substantial organization that can actually help people take the steps they need to take to get connected to an organizer or learn more about their labor rights. You know, all the things that you don't learn at school and you don't necessarily get from other social work organizations as far as we can find. Um, and so the goal with NSWA is to create a worker center, ideally a national digital worker center that would be accessible to social workers across uh, the country uh, in hopes of kind of, uh, you know, providing resources, getting folks connected to organizers in their area uh, and uplifting the profession as a whole, uh, which would include, you know, identifying leaders. You know, if you want to start a campaign in your workplace or in your state, we're going to have your back. And that's really the essence behind NSWA. That's so powerful because I'm just thinking that if I'm a social worker and I just have no clue like where to start a union, I know that we need one, right? Like I know that I need to be part of a bigger group because there's just stuff happening in my workplace and it is not cool. It sounds like I would be able to then call the National Social Work Alliance Worker Center and just get some guidance, some support, maybe some mentorship from you girls. Is that, am I on the right track there? Yeah, I would say that's actually exactly it. Yeah, you would have the ability to reach out to us and we would be able to help you access um, and make connections as you would need them, uh, just depending on where you are in the process too, because I think a lot of folks who have reached out to us initially um, just wanna know, you know, they just wanna know, like, what does this even mean? What would that look like? Because one person can really start a massive movement, but that's quite an intimidating thing to think about, right? Um, and so our hope is to just, you know, help empowering folks to get more uh, connected to that, that like in advocate, right? Uh, but flip it into inwards so that they, they advocate for themselves and their colleagues. I like it. Trisha, did you have anything to add? Oh, yeah, you know, I, I went to, I started talking and I realized that it was on you. So, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so basically everything Joy said, but, um, you know, like, there's there's this narrative that social workers uh, tend to, you know, embrace and that's uh, this notion that self-care is, you know, obviously, like, if you're burnt out, it's your, you know, self-care that's the problem. You're not doing it well enough. Like, you could be doing something differently. Like, we always, like, focus inward rather than going and stopping and looking at the actual system and going, like, this is wrong. This is not how it should be. You shouldn't have to, you know, fight through tons of red tape every day just to get to the resource that your client needs. That's not the way things should work. Um, and it's inherently wrong. So rather than stepping back and looking at the system as a whole and going, how can we actually change this system? We could rebuild it. We can knock it over. You know, we could do so much more than, than what what we, you know, suffering individually in silos like we have been. And I've seen this across organizations, I've seen it across, you know, communities, like in our government, everywhere. So we, we are, you know, for the people that are in power, the last thing they want to see is an organized, powerful group of angry social workers, <laughs> is what I keep saying. So. Yeah, I would just add too, you know, like the level of burnout that we experience and the um, the really unfortunate circumstance that folks find themselves in where they go into the profession with a passionate want, right, to work with a specific population or with a specific organization. And, you know, five years in, which is nothing, that's like junior work right there. They're so burned out that they end up leaving or they jump from job to job because essentially what happens is you go into the job, you do the work, you come burned out and instead of helping change the organization because it feels so difficult to do, you just bounce around to the next, right? 
And we hear that narrative over and over and over again. And so that victim blaming that occurs within employment saying, you know, you're not doing self-care right. Um, we, we actually completely disagree with that and say, you know, the answer to self-care is unionizing. It's getting organized and it's changing the conditions in which you work because that is what self-care is. And it's on the employer to provide it. It's not on you to learn how to do it. Girl, do not get me started on self-care and burnout. I'm learning that is my passion. That is like my little like spot that I am just, I just, it just lights me up and gets me all fired up because you're right, like you're right. Um, after reading, even after reading the code of ethics, it says self-care is on you. And then it'll say, oh, but um, you know, the employer should also do something about it. So what I've heard from employees is that the employer says, do your self-care and leave 15 minutes early. There's your self-care. Like, no, no, come on. We need like a retreat day at the spa <laughs> once a month. Like this is a regular thing. And I like to say that sounds extravagant, but no, I don't think so because we hold space for such pain and such traumatic events all freaking day, every day, like so much. And at, you're right, after five years, Girl, I, I've been in the field and I'm licensed now and the amount of job openings that I see for LCSWs for with five years plus experience, so much, but even I don't want to do it because I know that what <laughs> that job entails and that stresses me the fuck out. So I don't know if you guys have anything to add to that. Well, yeah, because then you look at the pay that's related to those jobs. So you know the trauma that it's going to entail. You know that self-care is going to be put on you. It's the burden that we all carry. And then on top of that, you know that you're going to be making significantly less than what you are worth. And so, you know, there's no incentive there for social workers to stick around. And there's no incentive for social workers to want to do the hard work um, because the conditions of the work just aren't worth it. Yeah, hundred percent. That's like, you know, you know, like for a while I was ready to, I was, I am one of the social workers that was looking to find another job in another market that has nothing to do with my field. Um, you know, and I started to look at the benefits that are offered, you know, they have like generous paid time off or like, you know, there's no like limit. You can just say how long, how much time you need and you get it. You, you know, they have, um, you know, other like perks and things, you know, and, and that's part of, you know, corporate America, though, that's not in the nonprofit sector. You know, why? Why is that not something that we have access to? You know, I saw a post the other day, there's, you know, shared PT, PTO programs and things like that. And major corporations are using that, uh, you know, it, but it exists in our field. Um, I understand why it exists in our field, but we could do a lot better for our people doing the work in the trenches than this. And I think that we need to set the bar much higher. You know, we, we expect, you know, students, social, like this is something that's really important to Joyce and I is that, you know, having these students that, that come and do work for you and they don't get compensated for it. They don't get any uh, benefits for it. And we know how, how hard that struggle is because having to do it ourselves and rely on other people to help support us. It it just, it doesn't make any sense. We shouldn't do this anymore. Right, yeah, I would add, you know, social work students learn about burnout before they even have the opportunity to jump into the field because of that, right? You have to uh, juggle your caseload at your internship where you're not getting paid. You have to juggle your uh, workload at school, which is usually, tremendous and a ton of reading. I remember that from school. Um, and then, you know, most folks end up working a full-time job on top of that. And so by the time they graduate, they're already burned out. And that's why, you know, um, the cycle just continues on and it starts from the very beginning. And I, I have yet to really find um, a, an academic institution that really does a good job teaching social work students about their labor rights and about the working conditions that they should demand and expect 
when they leave school. Um, I think that's actually a huge gap in um, social work education as a whole, maybe even just social service education as a whole, because I don't think we're the only ones who experience this. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All of it, right? So I'm curious, being in this space for for what, like a year now or so, I think it's fair to say almost, what are, what have been the top two questions that people have come to you to ask you? So something that Jason has noticed is um, in our group, you know, they'll join our group, Union and Social Work Now, and they're like, hey, I thought this was a union, you know, so they get the impression that they have joined one when they join our group. Um, you know, so Grace, you want to take that one? I'll do my best. Um, I think the the top two questions, that's a good one because we get a lot. Um, the first is, I want to learn more, where do I go? And um, right now the answer isn't all that clear, you know, um, even when you want to join the union from our own research, you have to research the unions themselves to find out which one is the best fit for you and for your workplace. And so even the process of, of getting connected to a union has a couple of barriers there because you don't really know, should I join a trade union? Should I join an industrial union? What does any of that mean? Um, and so the first, the first question I would say is most common is just where do I start? Um, and that's an, a question that we want to answer. And we want to have um, resources readily available for folks when they get to that point. Um, the second one, I would say, you know, it's not even much of a question. I think it's more so just sharing of the story. You know, I started working in the field at this time and I've been in the field for this long. And th this is all the stuff that I've experienced. And I wish I would have known, you know, I wish I would have known what I know now. I wish I would have known how to start a union or how to get involved in a union. Um, and I think there's, you know, a lot of um, kind of reliving past trauma in our group sometimes and folks just trying to heal, right? Um, and, and having those conversations around the past experiences that people have had has been really um, for us because it helps kind of navigate the mission that we want to really work towards. Um, but yeah, I don't, I'm sorry that doesn't answer like the two questions. I don't know if we, I think the biggest one is always just where do I start? Yeah. So I think that the, it's really important to understand too that this, you know, Joyce and I are in a role that, you know, we are taking on a leadership role, right? But we are also not experts in this either. We want, you know, our, our aim here is we want to figure this out. You know, we're very motivated. We've dedicated a lot of time and energy into this and we want to continue on with this mission. Um, you know, we really want to call other, other social workers you know, other leaders that want to step up and, and figure it out with us, you know, and problem solve. Use, use our skills to the best of our abilities to find out how do we help ourselves, you know. And, you know, this goes back to that first day in social work class when they're sitting there telling you, put the oxygen mask on you first when the plane's going down instead of somebody else. You know, um, I think that we collectively have to do this as a profession. And once we can better position ourselves, we can also work with other community organizations and individuals, our clients, and we can all partner together and secure resources. Uh, I think that we are so powerful and yet we don't always understand or know that. So we really wanna focus on building that collective power with each other. Yep, agree. I fully believe that social workers are the most undertapped resource of power and advocacy that we have in the entire country, maybe the world, but for sure in the United States. Um, so I'm, I'm just so excited for you guys. I'm wondering, you know, if people are also resonating with your message, how can they get involved? I guess, where do they start? <laughs> Mm 
Well, we've got our website. Um, it's um, nswalliance.org. Um, so you can start there. That's a good place. Uh, we're also on Instagram. Also, um, Instagram and Twitter are the same name. So it's at NSW Alliance. Um, you know, so they could just find us in any of those ways. We've also got our, um, our email addresses are up there too. So if people have questions, they can reach out to us. Um, you know, we're really looking to expand. And we're, like I said, we're looking for leaders that want to step up and work alongside us in this effort. Um, so, so far we've got, uh, you know, us and then uh, somebody that's working with us also, uh, she's a doctoral student. She's really cool. Her name's Becky. Um, I don't know how to say her last name. I'm going to butcher it. But um, so she's working in Alaska and she's doing her DSW on social work and labor. So really exciting uh, to see her work and the things that she's doing. So she wants to start building a group, like an organizing group in Alaska as well. So very cool. So we, if we find others that want to get, you know, dig in the dirt with us and help figure it out, like, that's fantastic. Maybe you don't have time to do that. I get it. You're really busy. You're a social worker. Um, you know, share our posts. Tell another social worker about us. Start talking about unionizing in your workplace. You know, do like any and all of the above. You know, we started our blog. Um, so that's been up for a couple of weeks now. So we're looking for people. You know, we're really looking to, you know, find other people that want to share their story and talk about what is it like being a social worker? What, what is the labor like? What is it, um, you know, what's your experience like? Is what we're really trying to capture there. Um, and so, you know, if you want to come right with us, we love guest bloggers. Come, come on over. That's awesome. Yeah, if you resonate with anything that Trisha and Joyce have said on this episode, definitely one, join their Facebook group because there are some fire conversations going on in there. Um, check out their website, follow them on Instagram, Twitter. Um, for sure, share their messages, share their posts. Social media is free, but it is so valuable. Okay, just getting that word out. Social media currency is a real thing. So thank you so much to both you, both of you ladies for your leadership, for your courage. You inspire me. You fire me up. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. This was fun. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Catherine. This is a lot of fun. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Social Workers Rise. If this episode helped you, please help me spread the word by leaving a review wherever you listen to your podcast and share that you're listening. Tag me on social media. I love it. I will repost and reshare. I love it. Social currency is free, but it is so valuable. Also, I'd love to hear from you on Instagram. I really do respond. I really do love it when you give me your feedback. Lastly, this is not therapeutic advice or business advice or any other kind of personalized advice. To get that, you definitely need me as your coach. So please, again, reach out to me on Instagram. I can't wait till next week. I will see you then. All the love. Bye.